Coming up on the Celtics Talk podcast, my buddy Jay King from The Athletic drops by. You got a chance to catch up with Brad Stevens this weekend. We talk about what is the Celtics path forward and is it the right path forward for this team that's been riding the roller coaster? Then later in the show, we catch up with Peyton Pritchard, talk a little bit about off-course stuff, dribbling in apartments, all that fun stuff. That's all coming up on the Celtics Talk podcast. All right, Jay King, The Athletic. I want to start your big article this weekend, catching up with Brad Stevens. Uh, I thought it was a great read, a little glimpse into the thank mind. You, you. you know, Brad's got a way of, of saying a lot without saying a whole lot. But um, I, what, I just want to start here. What was your biggest takeaway? What did you walk away thinking, oh, wow, what did I learn from Brad Stevens? I thought one of the things that stood out was that he predicted Peyton Pritchard would stay in the rotation and continue getting significant minutes moving forward, even when the Celtics get healthy, because obviously he's played more minutes recently, but Marcus Smart has been out or another perimeter player has been out. Brad predicting that he'll play when healthy suggests that somebody's minutes are going to get cut or somebody will be on the way out of town. Who could it be? Cough, cough, Dennis Schroeder. <laughs> uh, so, so that, that stood out to me. Then the insistence that, they need a lot more shooting. Um, when I asked him about, you know, what the supporting cast needs, he just spoke about shooting the entire time. And Pritchard was part of that answer um, from Brad. So I, I do think that's probably pretty telling that that Brad thinks Pritchard can help with the shooting issue, thinks Pritchard deserves to play no matter how healthy they are. Um, and obviously the Schroeder situation is is looming as a pretty important one for the Celtics as the trade deadline approaches because of the bird right situation, yep. the Celtics won't be able to pay him what he can probably fetch from another team. Although I sometimes wonder, I, I will say this, I have heard from multiple people that there is support in that organization for Dennis Schroeder. And I think we all have just come to the assumption that it's a foregone conclusion that he gets traded. Whereas as we start to see the Celtics maybe lean in a little heavier to the fact that they're going to probably try to make a push here, regardless of the ups and downs. And so I do wonder if there's some thought to just, Hey, let's, ride it to the summer. Does a second round draft pick mean anything if all we're going to do is trade it for the next trade exception that they have, you know, for, for two years from now. And so, um, but right, like if the right deal comes along and I do think there's going to be more buyers than sellers, I do think it's more likely than not that Dennis Schroeder goes, I guess I want to get your, 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 your feelings here. Uh, you probably know, like I am sort of leaning into, if you're going to ride the roller coaster for a few things for me, you like got to play the kids that maybe you do have to think about taking a step back as hard as that may be. Where are you with this team and where you would like to see them sort of uh, take a path here? Yeah, I think that they kind of, it's kind of complicated um, because I don't think there's any obvious answer mm -hmm. to pushing them forward to the next level. I do think that you need to find out what you have in Romeo Langford, Aaron Neesmith and Peyton Pritchard. I do think that needs to be somewhat of a, priority especially because we've seen already this team isn't good enough they could make a charge over the next few weeks or whatever against a, a pretty you know weak schedule they they could they should probably be in better position by the time the trade deadline arrives but we've seen enough to know that this is not a contender this mm -hmm. this is not going to be a team that that you know has a chance to to win a championship and so if you don't have a chance to win a championship and you look around and Dennis Schroeder, like I, I do think this current version of the team, their their ceiling comes with Dennis Schroeder involved and comes with Dennis Schroeder being good. But I also think he's a tough fit next to Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown because they're all shoot first, score first guys. And I think the the numbers, especially the numbers in crunch time, have kind of borne that out. So so I I think you know, what Brad has probably learned about this team, like, like he said, they need more shooting. They, mm -hmm. they just, it's, it's a desperate need. It makes things difficult for everybody else. And Schroeder's not part of that. Um, so I, I would, I would tend to think that, that they probably do trade Schroeder, but like you said, it, it's probably not as easy as, as some people make it seem. 
one thing I've tried to stress to people is I think, and I think this is just for the Celtics and in, in for the totality of this year is you have a first year coach who gets brought in and unlike Brad, who even had a year where he could just lean on Gerald Wallace and uh, Rodney Magruder and, and all of that, that ragtag group where like it was okay to lose games. Like he may feels pressure and that's why he played Josh Richardson early. And that's why he's leaned on, but that was Brad's problem too. Like Brad played Jeff Teague a whole bunch last year and just like, when you're a coach and you feel pressure to win, you lean on the guys that got you there. So I understand it, but I do think Brad either has to do what Danny should have done with him and maybe cleared things out a little bit and made it easier to play the kids. And, you know, now, but that's going to be hard for Brad to do. And that's going to be hard for Emi to say, yeah, I think that's the right path forward. So I'll be very interested to see how they proceed. It's just, you know, it's, it's a weird spot to be in, but I do worry that the worst place to be as an NBA team is sort of stuck in the middle. You know, you're not getting the draft pick. You're not developing young guys that could be trade assets. And so they got to lean in one way or another. I, I also have to say, I do enjoy that Brad kind of tried to justify how much shooting was on the roster. He was like, well, you know, we got Aaron, we trust them. We trust Peyton. It was like, yeah, but coming into the year, we all said the same thing. The shooting has not been what it needs to be to accentuate the talents of the Jays. And that to me is, is, is where they need to, 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 to upgrade. So if, what would you do? Do you go out there? Do you try to find, instead of trading Schroeder for a second, do you take a guy that maybe has some rights and try to get a shooter? Do you move another part? I like, I've been of the oak that maybe they do move one of these young guys if you're just not going to be able to play them all. So I do think there's some potential moves for them at the deadline. What's if you're GM Brad, what are you hunting for? Besides, well, the other I mean, besides the obvious shooting. The other piece of this too is are they going to make moves to get under the luxury tax? One hundred percent. Because they're they're close enough. They could they could definitely make a move, make two moves, and get under that tax. We saw them do it last year. They they traded Daniel Tice for essentially nothing, um, but to get under the tax. And this not this a great a, move. <laughs> yeah, this is another team that's sort of like last year's team, like where Ugh. they're they're fine. They can be competitive on some nights. They have enough top end talent. You wonder about what they would look like if they figure it all out. But so I think the luxury tax is, is looming as another factor um, that Brad will have to consider. And then, yeah, I, I think shooting, passing, cutting, mm. like all that stuff that would just make it easier for Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown. You know, Brad came in and, and said over the summer af after he switched roles, that his main focus was accentuating those guys' strengths and and making things easier for those guys. I don't think they've done a good job of that. Nope. I, I do think, you know, Brad's job was tough. He came in, immediately had to trade a productive player in Kemba Walker for basically financial reasons, although they picked up Al Horford, who's been good, especially defensively. But, you know, when, when you're when – you're, coming in and having to deal talent right away. And there were just a lot of things that he needed to fix. And obviously he chose competitiveness. He chose guys with edge. He chose fiery Dennis Schroeder and fiery Josh Richardson and guys that can't necessarily sh shoot very well. <laughs> although Richardson's done a good job both, from both behind of them, the three-point arc. Out last of nowhere. six games, they're like two of the six guys above 40%. It's like, yeah. it's crazy. So, but he clearly leaned into defense and tenacity and all that right. stuff. And to his credit, they've been a very good defensive team, but they need more shooting. They need more passing. And I, I think that would just make everything so much easier for Tatum and Brown. The Celtics are trying to turn those guys into playmakers and, and well, decision-making becomes so much easier when you can just make a simple pass and the guy can <laughs> knock down a three. And it's so, so funny I, when you watch other teams do it and it's like, why can't the Celtics just make that easy play? And when Grant Williams gets hot, it's like, oh my God, this is just so easy. Jason Tatum can kick it to the corner on a drive and there you go. Uh, the obviously most polarizing uh, topic around every trade deadline is what happens with Marcus Smart. If you're the Celtics, do you listen? We've heard, you know, rumblings that uh, the Celtics have to at least explore the possibility uh, if you're Brad Stevens is Marcus Smart here into next season. I mean, with with most of this stuff, it all depends on what you're offered, of what what you could get. I do think that Marcus Smart fits into the vision for this team. I, I think defensively, obviously, he is a huge plus. I, I think this year, for the most part, he's curtailed some of the bad habits offensively. He hasn't 
taken the same bad shots. He, for the for the most part, I think has has done a better job there, and uh, has been more willing to lean into the passing, all that stuff. His usage rate, I think, is is down. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I think, but at the same time, if if he's your third best offensive player or creator then you're probably gonna have issues and so I think smart you know as a as a piece as a a great defender as as the versatile guy who can run pick and rolls and find teammates and be a little bit of everything like that makes a lot of sense Mm -hmm. so I don't think he's part of the problem um I think he could be part of the solution if the roster is right but I think Brad has to kind of gauge everything because of where the Celtics are, because of where they've been for the last two years. And because right now, you know, they haven't found the mix that that works um, to push them beyond just kind of mediocrity. And, and that's where I ultimately land is as much as I have debated the, the, the merits of taking that step back, like any season that Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown are healthy, you kind of want to go for it. You're not promised any of these years. And so you kind of, you have to balance that all as you're, you're making those decisions. I I agree with you. I don't, as much as it's easy to say this core doesn't work like, well, this core doesn't work because the pieces around the core don't exactly fit them. And I think that, you know, it'd be a lot easier for me to say yeah, they need to move on from Marcus smart. If I had, if I could see this with more shooting around it and maybe we will, maybe we'll, from February 10th till April 10th, we'll get a glimpse of what it looks like with some more shooting. And maybe we, at that point we do say, all right, you know, this mix doesn't work, but those are things you got to figure out. And, you know, I, I keep going back to the kids and, and, and trying to, 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 to figure out what you've got there. I, I cannot agree more. It's I, like, I don't know if Romeo Langford is, is the someone who's long for this club or for complimentary piece. His salary goes up to $5.6 million next year. That's a tough decision when you're, when you're, when you're, uh, your budget is going up and all that, but uh, you got to figure that out. And so very interested to see how they, how they proceed. I did, before I turn the, the page to, um, to uh, the last five out of six games, I, I will, I will leave you with this on after the Dennis Schroeder conversation. Um, do you know what the best three man lineup offensive rating wise has been the last six games? Is it Schroeder, Tatum and Brown? Yeah. 117.1. <laughs> so, you know, cause I'm the well, same way. The numbers have not been good this year. And especially in crunch time, I bet it dives off a cliff in the fourth quarter. Maybe, you know, I, I have to double check that, but it did make me laugh to see that, uh, that it had had some success and it's not going to temper those who would like to see Dennis Schroeder stick around if this team is going to make a push, but yeah. Right. And, and w- while we're still on the trade talk yeah. stuff, I, I think there are examples of teams that have changed the supporting cast mm-hmm. and it does everything for the star players. Like you look at even the warriors last year, they were in the playing tournament with Stephen Curry, with Draymond Green, and they went out and got Otto Porter and Nemanja Bielica, two guys who were basically overlooked and hadn't mm-hmm. been great in recent stops. They went out and got Gary Payton the second, who's been awesome for them, who was just on the scrap heap. And so if you hit like a few minor moves, all of a sudden that can make a huge difference for your supporting mm-hmm. cast. It can It can propel you from a team that's, Got a lot of problems trying to figure stuff out to, oh, okay, now now it all makes sense. And I think, you know, the Bulls, they picked up DeRozan, but it was also they went and got Lonzo Ball and Alex Caruso who complement their best players, who play defense, who make things easier for guys offensively. And so I, I think, you know, the Celtics, it, it seems like they're very far away. But when you look at the net rating, when you look at, you know, just – the the totality of their stat like they're really not that far away from being competitive um maybe they are far away from being contenders but i think of a few tweaks to the supporting cast could go a really long way for this team moving forward so who are those guys gmj that's a very good question guys who can shoot (laughs) guys who can pass i i think like just skilled iq guys you know and like Schroeder and Richardson have have been productive. Richardson, I think, has has fit well. Um, when Schroeder's good, he's he's really really helpful. But at the same time, like 
they're not the highest IQ guys. They're not guys who are going to be racing around off ball and and making the the ball movement and the player movement more lively. And I think that's what the Celtics need. They they need guys because Tatum and Brown aren't aren't perfect at that. Mm-hmm. And because like you need to fill in where their weaknesses are. And I don't think the Celtics have done enough of that. Well, wait till we watch Charlotte tomorrow and marvel at all their movement and oh yeah, they, I mean, they move a lot. I mean, with do. with a lot of former Celtics. And that's the thing. It kind of hurts. It's a little trip down memory lane that Celtics fans maybe don't want to they don't want to go. A little T Rose T Rose there at, at point guard and wondering, wondering what might have been. Uh last five out of the six, they've won a uh, couple fourth quarter. Uh, and then not falling apart in the fourth quarter, I guess is the best way to phrase it, which is, is, is encouraging. What's your biggest takeaway from this little stretch? And, uh, should we buy in to this team based on, on five out of six? I don't know if you should buy into the team just because (laughs) they've beaten some bad Bad or beaten up opponents lately, but they've shown progress in closing out games that, are close at the end. You know, the, the the Chicago game was a classic example of a game they fumble away earlier in the season. DeMar DeRozan gets going. Earlier in the season, like a week ago. Yeah. DeMar DeRozan <laughs> gets going. He, he's dicing them up. He's making every right decision. They fall behind by seven late in the fourth quarter. And then all of a sudden, Jason Tatum is making defensive plays. They're finding Robert Williams. They made all the clutch plays down the stretch. You know, the 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 Pelicans game, obviously the, the Pelicans aren't the greatest team in the world, but they've been playing pretty well recently. Celtics are down 18. They hadn't come back from – or 17, I think. They hadn't come back from that far all season. And and so for them to overcome that and just keep chipping away and not try to make the home run play over and over, I think that shows growth. Um, and that's kind of what's, what's interesting about this team is – they're one game over 500 now. Things haven't been good. The East is very tough. So you wonder like what their ceiling is, but also you know that there's something more than what they've been mm-hmm. so far in that group. Like they're, they could be more than just this middling 500 team. So we'll see. Maybe Brad can. And I also want to see how, how does Brad handle a trade deadline? You know, Dan, Danny, even though he had the name Trader Danny, for the most part, trade deadlines mm-hmm. were pretty quiet. You know, uh, he, he picked up Fournier last year, but I think before that it was like five straight yeah. trade deadlines where they didn't make a move. So will Brad, <laughs> will Brad be trigger happy? Will, will Brad be out there making a bunch of moves? Will he be trying to really rearrange the supporting cast? Will he wait for the off season? I think we, we don't have much evidence or any evidence of what Brad will be like come trade deadline. So I'm, I'm looking forward to the, uh, the newness of it. Pottering Brad or whatever we're going to call him. Uh, like we need that. We need a, we need a name for, for Brad Stevens, but I'm with you. I'm, I'm fascinated to see. I think he did show a little bit of a, of a willingness with that Kemba trade to make a tough decision in that instance. Now, will that trickle over to in season when Brad, as much as anyone knows the value of roster continuity and all that, uh, all that being said, if we, you know, you brought up Danny Ainge, if we think back to probably Danny's best moves, going out and finding Isaiah and Gigi and Jerebko and, you know, pushing that team over the top a little bit and putting them Gigi. in position to, yeah. I mean, like I those legends, Gigi. I should put a, I need a photo of Gigi up on the wall somewhere here. Uh, he deserves his own number 71 <laughs> on the, uh, on the, on the wall somewhere, not 71. Uh, what was he? 70, do you remember what it was? 73, 71, 73, 71 was Schroeder, so must've been 72, 73. I forget. I'm going to find it right now. Yeah. Here, go, go into it. It was, it was always just fascinating that, that, that he, it was the number he picked, but yeah, that's uh that's on, that's on Brad to the, to make that decision here about, um, you know, how this thing looks and, and how it proceeds. Number 70, 70. Okay. So I was close. I was knocking on the door. Um, they've, they've had, now they have like a bunch of guys that look like, it always looks like an offensive line out there. When the Celtics were signing random dudes to 10 day contracts, I was like, Get the Patriots offensive line out there, just not the same uh, size <laughs> and uh, stature. Um, we're let's talk about talking about the Patriots, man. No, no, we're not. That we're not wound going is there. still fresh. We're we're, we're, uh, we're 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 hoping that all those Patriot fans are going. Oh, look, Celtics are surging. Let's go find out <laughs> a little bit about that team and check out the Celtics Talk podcast. Um, will does he may have the depending regardless of what brad makes the moves will do you think he may has the ability to lean into playing the kids when he's still balancing it let's say 
I, I guess in this scenario, let's say Schroeder and Richardson somehow either survive straight up to February 10th or, you know, maybe even beyond. Um, will he find carve out time for these kids? And should he based on the minutes that some of these veterans are playing? Well, here's the thing. They haven't made it. The young players have not made it automatic for him sure. to give them minutes at all. You know, Pritchard early in the season was missing a bunch of shots, not being productive. Aaron Neesmith, I think he's shooting like, 24 percent from three or something like that romeo langford he's scoring like nine points per 36 minutes so the offensive production just hasn't been there and so they haven't forced their way into the rotation i also think brad because of how he felt as a coach with so much inexperience on his roster went out and wanted to give mm -hmm. the the new coach emil doka more veteran options and he went out and got Schroeder and Richardson and Freedom and a bunch of guys for that bench with a lot of experience that have made it tough for Neesmith, Langford, and Pritchard to to find the court. So Brad could make it easier for Ime to get there by moving Richardson, by moving Schroeder, by doing whatever. Um, but also, I think I think it's a lot of it is on the, those young guys to be productive when they get the opportunity. And I don't think Ime's always made it easy on them. Like a lot of the time when he uses those guys, he does it in units that like they're all together. Right. Like the first half against the Pelicans, it was Pritchard, Lankford, Neesmith. <laughs> was it Tatum and, and Freedom? And it's like, yeah, it, I mean, think about that. Together, I think you had the tweet, right? Like they, they don't them. play together one other time. And I couldn't believe they had played together one other time. Yeah. So it, it, like if you play Pritchard alongside Tatum, Brown, your better players, maybe it looks better. You know, if you play Neesmith with those guys as they did in the second half, it looked good. You know, he he was out there running and dunking and playing D and being his normal, energetic, chaotic self. So it sounds like Neesmith will get more of an opportunity soon. It sounds like Udoka's ready to see what he can provide. Um, and I want to see it too. Neesmith. I mean... Uh, he seems like a guy who the more minutes he gets, the more comfortable he plays. So we'll see if that trend continues. Oh, so every young guy ever, if uh, yeah. you get playing time and can play through mistakes, you can actually. Although Robert uh, Williams is per 36 minute production was just always sky high. <laughs> <you know? laughs> that That's all I hooked, I hooked my wagon to. I, I might have to, as, as Rob goes to another ascends to the stratosphere of clear third star of this team. Uh, <laughs> maybe I have to, maybe I have to hitch my, my uh, hype train powers to, Aaron Neesmith, which does beg the question, though, and maybe I, I can tell you're lean based on that answer. But if, if if the Celtics are forced to commit to to one, two of these guys, and I'd throw Grant in this mix, I'll throw Romeo, Aaron, Peyton, you know, anybody else that like, if you want to tell me that they should lean into uh, Yuhan Magaron or whatever, like however you want to <laughs> like, you want to deal with this one. But who are the guys that if if you're prioritizing young talent? at the deadline, who, who do you want on this roster long-term? I think Grant Williams has established himself just by outplaying the competition. Like at the start of this season, remember preseason, they started Wancho Hernan Gomez. I, I, was, so many, I was almost going to joke about that, but the guy, like, like, th there was, there was a competition for <laughs> power forward minutes between Wancho and Jabari Parker and Grant Williams and Grant after pretty inconsistent year last year, a rocky year last year, has just really been solid for the Celtics. His three-point shooting has jumped through the roof. Um, so Grant, because of the fact that he's proven himself and proven that he can play four or play five if you need him to in a pinch, like I, I just think Grant's a guy that can help a good team. Um, Pritchard would be my next just because we saw during his rookie season, he – He's productive. He can really shoot. And I think shooting can, you know, the Celtics need more of that. They could use more of that on the court. Um, and obviously he needs to continue growing as a playmaker, as a point guard, someone who gets in the paint and can actually do more than just shoot. But I think his shooting kind of is, has, is already at an M a plus NBA level. Sure. Um, and so he has that skill where I'm not sure Neesmith and Langford have shown that yet. Mm -hmm. You know, those guys, because of their length, because their athleticism, the defensive potential, 
are intriguing. Uh, and Neesmith, especially if he can be the shooter that he was in college, the shooter that he was before college, like that's intriguing. But those guys need to prove um, that they can fit in offensively and, and contribute offensively because, you know, Ro- Romeo, after two games of hot shooting at the beginning of the season, has really fallen off three-point wise. And Neesmith, after emerging toward the end of last season, has not been able to find his outside stroke at all. So they need to prove it um, in order to be part of the the future plans. It's interesting because I'm probably looking at it a little differently in terms of just like I'm kind of I'm doing like the future power ranking of like how I think they can evolve and be the most impactful. And I think, you know, I, I just have really high hopes for Neesmith. I think just the way he plays, the energy he brings can be a real game changer for this team. But I fully admit he has as much as anybody, as much strides to make as possible. Probably only Romeo has more just because he has to be out there and he has to be consistent. He's had more opportunity even with the injuries than the others and hasn't been able to take advantage. Here's my question with your rankings. What's Grant's ceiling? Can he be a starter? Like, I mean, you could convince me this year he should be a starter that maybe they need to think about, you know, moving out to the bench if Al's shot's going to struggle. And, and, but is he like the long term fit there? And is, can he be a super productive player in a smaller role? I think the answer is yes, but, you know, I'll let you tackle that one. And then, um, you know, with Pritchard, same deal. Like, what, what, what's the ceiling for, for, for these guys if those are the guys you hit your wagon to? Yeah, Grant, I, I think, you know, he, He's he's not the same player PJ Tucker is, but mm-hmm. that would be his lane. Like shoot threes, play defense, be able to defend anyone from one to five. There is huge value in that. Mm-hmm. And I think Grant has gotten much, much better at defending without fouling this season, which has been huge. He couldn't have got much worse. <laughs> yeah, he could not <laughs> have got I don't know if he could have got any worse because he would have been fouling out, I think, every single game. So that's been huge for him, I think. The three point progression has been huge um and then every once in a while like that game against phoenix a couple other times like he showed he's shown he can be a little more than just a Mm spot-up guy like maybe post up mismatches maybe ducking against smaller guards on switches like there's a little bit more to his game than just pure three and d and if he can continue tapping into that and continue tapping into his passing, which was really impressive at Tennessee, but hasn't really been shown too much in the NBA, uh, then maybe there's more for him than just a P.J. Tucker, like, grind it out and then stand in the corner role. Yeah. Um, but I think it it obviously begins with the defensive versatility and the three-point shooting. And then uh, Pritchard, like, the comparisons to Fred Van Vliet have been there since before he got into the league. Obviously, Van Vliet is probably going to be an all-star. Like, there's a huge gap right now between Pritchard and Van Vliet. But that sort of progression where you go from, okay, undersized guard who can shoot to all of a sudden Van Vliet is an undersized guard who took over for Kyle Lowry and runs the offense really well and has continued to increase his shooting versatility and is still a super tough guy who can guard bigger players and fit into a – versatile defense even though he's six foot or whatever he is so I think Van Vliet is a guy that Pritchard should watch a lot uh, because they have some of the same limitations and also some of the same strengths Uh, I will get you out of here on this Uh, give me one bold prediction I should have prompted you for this and given you time to think about it so I'm going to put you on on the spot before February 10th What's your uh, what's your bold prediction for Brad or these Celtics or, you know, because like I feel like if you told me staying pat would be a bold prediction for this team. If you told me that, you know, uh, Brad swinging for the fences or, or maybe it's it's a longer term. What do you think? What do you think? How do you think this all plays out over the next uh, not only month, but straight through to, you know, hopefully more consistent times next year? Yeah, I think my my I, it's not a bold prediction, but my guess would be that the Celtics get under the luxury tax. Mm-hmm. Um, That's going to excite people to no end. <laughs> that, people will be really excited about Ownership's that. getting a huge check for, for their tax refund uh, because the, the, all the other taxpayers. But I do think, and I stress this, as, as much as it, it's like, you know, you can sit there and go, er, what do I care about owners making money? It does matter in the long term because your payroll is going to explode if you add another impact player at 10, 20 million dollars, whatever the number is. And so I do caution people, like as much as you don't get excited right now, uh, it might mean the long-term uh, competitiveness of your team is enhanced. Yeah, and they'll have a lot of avenues to build out the supporting cast this summer. 
You know, they, they've got the $17 million trade exception. Mm-hmm. They've, they've got a first round pick, which they didn't have last season after, after Brad traded it away. No need to rub it in. Yeah. So, you know, I, I do think there will be avenues to finding a, a more fitting supporting cast that can hopefully play a little crisper basketball, especially <laughs> offensively. They just get bogged down so much offensively. It's um, crazy. It's crazy to watch. I don't understand how like the team, the team we saw in the first half yesterday against the Pelican versus the team we saw in the second half is like the same basketball team. Like there are times yeah. where I just sit there and I, and I get it. I mean, there's no shortage of reasons why turnovers and attacking, but I just, yeah, sometimes I sit there and say, man, poor per Ime must be sitting there sometimes. Yeah. And I, I think Brad knows how tough of a job Ime has because yeah. Brad dealt with it last season. <laughs> Brad's teams always move the ball. They always cut so hard. They were always great at those little things. And then last year, none of it. And so those were all the things that Brad was best at cultivating. And Brad couldn't get it out of them, you know. And now the supporting cast is a little different, obviously. But it's still a, a lot of the same problems offensively. Defensively, they've been really good this year. Um, and that's that's the one thing you, you can take away. Like, that's promising. And I think back – because of the defense, I think back to the 2017-18 season, which was Kyrie's first year in Boston. Mm-hmm. He and Gordon Hayward both got injured. They made it to the Eastern Conference Finals anyway. And they did it with an awesome defense, and they did it with timely buckets. It wasn't a great offense. It wasn't an offense that necessarily, like, wowed you or played perfect, fluid basketball. It was just, like, they had enough offensively that they were great defensively. And that's where the Celtics need to get to, where mm-hmm. where they can ride their defense and then get to a place where in the fourth quarter they have Jason Tatum and they have Jalen Brown and put those guys in positions to succeed and not f- fold in those moments and just ride your defense. And I, I do think there's a formula there to being very competitive, but obviously they they haven't maximized those guys yet. They haven't maximized this team yet. Yeah, I figured it out. Sign Terry Rozier. <laughs> Terry, no, I mean, Terry like, look, we're, that's a whole other podcast going backwards with us to talk about that. But yeah, no, it, it's uh, it's funny how uh, yeah that that roster even even in, even once they lost Kyrie and, and and Gordon was still chock full of talent. And uh, you know, Brad's got to find that same mix and the same guys that play with that fire and and know how to make it work. So that's Brad Stevens' challenge. Uh, but I do think I was going to, uh, uh, all right, very last thing. Do you think Brad like takes a little bit of, of watching this be a little bit frustrating and sits there and goes, see, wasn't me. <laughs> You'll never admit it. Right. <laughs> but you know, but 100%, you know, like if you took him, my buddy's run a brewery, penny pinches here in Millbury. If we took him there and got him a few beers, do you think he'd be like, so remember when everyone's getting all that heat last year? That was, that was a good plug. That was a good plug. Yeah. I don't, think brad is really wired that way to where he would even think about that but i also think last season he knew like all the things i've been teaching my whole life i'm i'm really damn good at at getting teams to move the ball and play hard and i don't know why i can't reach this team and it so i i i think there is some of that where he's like okay he may can't do it either (laughs) And that's why when people come down, on maybe, you, maybe we got to get gotta... new players in town. <laughs> well, Brad Stevens, we'll give you credit on one hand, but now let's see what you got for the trade deadline. We're all eager to see. All right. Jay King, the athletic, go check out his article, his interview with Brad. I thought it was really good. And all this stuff Thank is you, good, sir. but like most Thanks. of that, most of that one article, but we'll catch, we'll see you soon. Jay King. Good stuff from my guy, Jay there. I miss him. I miss all my friends. Uh, I went back to TD garden for a game a couple weeks ago and uh, none of my friends were there. COVID, COVID ravaged them all. So uh, Jay, I, well, I shouldn't say that. Jay, Jay avoided it, but you know, he, he still had to stay away because he wasn't feeling well for a day. But kid, the, the corona couldn't get the kid. So uh, he is doing well. From, uh, from one legend to another, uh, Peyton Pritchard has, uh, has had moments this season. He had his own bout with COVID that maybe deterred his playing time, but uh, got his ball handling skills in his apartment and uh, got himself back out on the court. Now the question is whether Ime Adoka will lean a little bit heavier into playing him. Here's me and Amina Smith catching up with him on Celtics Post Up.
Let's welcome in Celtics guard Peyton Pritchard. And Peyton, thank you so much for taking the time out to join us today. And I want to start with this team. You know, at the beginning of the season, you guys were struggling to find your rhythm offensively. However, as of late, it seems like everything is starting to click, especially for you, shooting 42% from three from the start of December. Just what is clicking for you out there on the court? You know, I just think, you know, obviously our team is obviously clicking a little bit better and uh uh, last 10 games were like seven and three. And so hopefully we continue to, to go on that path. But, you know, obviously for me, I think um, one, not wearing a mask has helped from the beginning of the season and then two, uh, just getting a little bit more playing time and stuff. So able to go out there and get a rhythm and a feel. So I want to talk about that mask for a second. Actually, I was when you Google you now, that is actually the fifth search that comes up. If you like scroll down on the autofill, oh, really? how <laughs> infuriating was it to wear that mask, and how eager are you to, were you to get rid of it at the start of the season? Very eager to get rid of it. Uh, it was it was definitely uh, really annoying because it would fog up. Um, you know, you're just not used to like playing with something over your face like that. Um, but I actually took it off uh, like a couple weeks before I was supposed to. So against like Cleveland. I just had enough of it, so I just took it off. <laughs> and then also, this team is trying to find some consistency this season. Obviously, you guys are coming off of back-to-back -back wins. Just what type of conversations are you guys having or what are you working on in order to find that consistency this season? You know, I think it's just got to be in our, our habits and how we attack uh, every day, uh, even on off days. We got to – our preparation has to be a little bit better, and I think, you know, we're showing growth in that area, but, you know – we have a stretch here at home and where we can take care of business and make a little run at this thing. Peyton, uh, some of my reporter buddies today at practice got a little video of you uh, going one on one with Jalen Brown and getting the better of him a little bit. How much trash talk goes on in those post practice sessions? And do you ever bring up that West Lynn versus Wheeler matchup that you guys won in high school? Uh, all the time. Uh, <laughs> But no, me and me and JB always uh, compete, and you know, usually, I got the better of him today. But it's usually the other way around. So for me, you know, he's an unbelievable talent. He's an all star. So for me to go against somebody like that every day, it's just making me better. So um, you know, that's like my brother, and we compete against each other. So it's good. And we were listening to you the other day when you came out of health and safety protocols talking about how you spent your time in health and safety protocols. And I thought to myself, you were talking about dribbling the basketball. How many complaints did you get from your neighbors from dribbling the basketball? I'm very curious. I'm surprised I didn't even get one because we was dribbling the ball in here and, and, uh, and I was on the phone and I had multiple people like Are the people downstairs, like not mad at you. <laughs> and I was like, I haven't got a complaint yet. So Maybe they heard and they just let it go for right now. Well, I mean, we can see your views right now. You were telling us you're what you're on like the eighth floor of your of, of your condo there. Like, I, do yeah. you just have like the nicest neighbors ever? Maybe you need to send some food downstairs. <laughs> like, I, I don't understand. No, I, how I this definitely. Is. I'm gonna I'm gonna need to give them like a couple presents, some gifts or something. <laughs> Yeah, see, I, I was telling Chris Forsberg during that show that I would definitely have to go upstairs and knock on your no, door. No, I told you you get the broom I, and you just start the broom. Oh, for sure. The floor. <laughs> see, I'm originally from yeah, New York. Sure. I'm originally from New York, so actually the broom might work for me if I did do that. It <laughs> just take the broom and just let you yeah. know, hey, you gotta keep it down a little bit up there with the I, basketball. I, I'm the I'm the same way. I'm the same way. I, I, I don't think I could let that happen either. So uh, there were used to there were these stories from you in high school that you would set your alarm for 5:15 a.m. get up and dribble the basketball for an hour till your hands bled at practice. How much of that are you still doing, especially in that COVID protocol? Are you like, are you dribbling for literally another hour around your apartment? What's what, how does this go on exactly? Well, I think you know uh, I think stories get exaggerated <laughs> a little bit, but um, I definitely was you know waking up early in the mornings growing up and and dribbling and, and doing all those things and you know, trying to outwork people. But now, you know, I think it's about like, you know, you're trying to keep everything tight. So I'm not spending as much time on those areas, but I still, you know, 20 minutes, uh, 20 minutes a day of ball handling, stuff like that. But I'm trying to work on different areas of my game. And obviously when you get older, you're trying to, um, you know, protect your body more and not, you know, just get ready for games. NBA is a little bit of a different grind with how many games we play. And now, Peyton, you seem like a pretty laid back guy, but we know that you once went viral with the Running Man Challenge. I seen you on TikTok with the game day vlogs. When is our next challenge coming? Because I, I need to see something on TikTok. I love the vlogs, but I need to see some challenges. Okay, I'll think of something. I usually, I really don't run that stuff. Like my roommate 
actually like he's the one that got me started on everything oh boy oh uh, this is oh uh, yeah no <laughs> this is high school this is yeah this is i don't know what i'm doing but <laughs> oh man i mean this is epic this is like gold this is internet gold it's not going yeah, anywhere no. obviously everyone loves it well, we gotta get you in on some more challenges we gotta get you doing something yeah. some dances maybe me and you could do one i'm not a good dancer you did the, the running man better than i could but maybe y'all could teach me something <laughs> So, so the problem was hey, figure something out. No, I'll think about it. We can we can figure something out. <laughs> Your teammates found these last year and put them all back online. Like, but like, tell me about going through that because I feel like that was a little bit of a, an, an endearing thing for your teammates to kind of embrace you. But are you worried? Are there any other videos out there that your that your teammates might find online that they could they could uh, use as propaganda? Uh, I don't think so. But you know, in the, the day, it's all it's all fun and jokes. So. Um, you know, you just laugh about it. And, you know, I got stuff on my other teammates that when the time comes, you know, you could use it against them. But uh, but I'm sure, shoot, there's got to be other videos or something out there. But uh, I just hope they don't get their hands on it. Did, did we ever land on a nickname for you? Did anything carry over from last season? I get different nicknames all the time from my teammates still. I mean, I hear P. Rabbit all the time. Mm -hmm. Uh Shoot, eight mile. Like, that's probably the one I hear the most. Eight mile I hear. I mean, I have people that ask me to sign eight mile on the balls, like <laughs> on like basketballs and wow. stuff like that. And I'm like, oh man, it's kind of, I ain't used to the eight mile, but, uh, but I think out of all the nicknames, I, I own mine P rabbit. That's uh, I'm all right with that one. P rabbit. I like P rabbit. I, I like that one. I don't know about eight mile, but now I could, I could kind of see it though. Now when you talk about the movie and P rabbit, I could kind of see it. Well, thanks so much Peyton Pritchard for stopping by the show. We really appreciate it. Thank you guys for having me. All right. Good stuff there from Peyton. Uh, I need you all to go like and subscribe. Check us out on the YouTube page. Uh, and we'll catch you next time on the Celtics talk podcast.